Okay, so let's continue following on here. So we synapse to other neurons, and we call this an interneuron. Oftentimes, interneurons are actually um, multipolar. So we see this taking it up, and this would be within, inter in between, and would be within the spinal cord, going through an ascending track. So a sensory pathway continues with second neuron projecting to the thalamus. So we'll, we'll be looking at these regions of the brain, so don't, don't despair yet. But a thalamus is a relay station, basically, within the brain itself. All right. Now, from the thalamus, then there'll be a short, another interneuron, that will carry this general sense up to most likely the parietal lobe. All right. So again, remember the blue pathway is all ascending, coming up to the brain. So sensory pathway reaches the cerebral cortex for conscious perception. All right. So you had sensation here. But what does that sensation mean? That's when we get perception. All right? So you perceive that this water is, I don't know, too, too cold. So now you will right, initiate a response because you want to warm it up, you know, right? turn the handle here. So the upper motor neuron, right? again, a multipolar neuron here, most likely in the frontal cortex, you're going to find out, or the frontal lobe of the, of the cortex. Um, gray matter here, that's where the cell bodies are, right? Executes a motor command, so it's going to be a directive, right? So going down from, we call these the upper motor neurons because they are right on top, right within the head, right? Transmits uh, an electrical stimulation down to the spinal cord through descending tracks, right? Remember the ascending was sensory, descending is motor, right? It'll synapse with a lower motor neuron generally in the spinal cord, and it'll be somewhere at the level with the hand. So this is probably part of the, the brachial uh, region, which is in the um, it's in the cervical and the and T1, I believe, of the thoracic. All right. So, and this upper motor neuron again came from the frontal lobe, comes all the way down to what we call the descending tracks of the spinal cord, uh, synapses at the level of the arm because it's going to go out to the hand and then sends right through this other lower motor neuron, here's a, the cell body motor multipolar, out to the muscles, right, that are part of the hand for grabbing this, right, we didn't study these ones, by the way, they'd be flexing the phalanges and, and, uh, and the hand itself would be moving then to respond to what you sensed. Ooh, that's a lot, right? <laughs> so here, anyway, um, as you look at this, you know, it's important to put this all together, so I really do like this cartoon. So this is continuing what I just said. At the end of the unipolar axon, the electrical change causes a release of a chemical neurotransmitter. So here we were just looking at this one coming in, and we get to the end, neurotransmitter. This crosses the synapse, so this is the same language we used when we talked about the, the neurons to, to the muscle cells. Crosses that, right, that area where they join together, binds receptors, yep, so um, depending, this time we'd have more than acetylcholine receptors, clearly. Um, but we're just going to say, in general, binds receptors, causes this new neuron to change electrically, just again, like the neuron causes the, caused the muscle cell to do this, and start its own action p potential moving down its axon. All right, so if we got enough electrical change here, we would stimulate the movement here, is what we're talking about. This reaches the brain. Right? And we said the thalamus specifically, which relays it to the cortex, and again, the parietal lobe of the cerebral cortex, for perception. In other words, how does it feel? What did you, what just happened here? All right. Uh, and I said, so you're nowhere. Uh, what if that water's not perfect? And I gave you an example of it being too cold. Right? So your sensory cortex, again, which is generally found in the parietal lobe, will communicate to another area of the cortex, the motor lobe, right, which is part of the frontal generally, and the motor will send an action potential through the somatic division, right, the responders, effectors, and these were your upper motor neurons, right, so they'd start in the frontal lobe and they'd go back down and out to the body, right, technically I said this is a notice from the upper motor neurons of the precentral gyrus of the frontal cortex, so we're going to get to all these terms eventually, moves down the spinal cord to again synapse with a lower motor neuron, join, right? This is the one that will tell your supinators and pronators in the forearm what to do, or your flexors and extenders in the fingers what to do. 
<laughs> and I say, here's a challenge. Next time you shower or bathe, you know, think about this. Think about the what's happening as you test that water. All right. So now getting down to the really zooming in. So now we've got the network, the pathways that these changes are going to travel. Let's look specifically at the changes that are occurring, all right, that we call an action potential, all right? So nerve tissue and muscle tissue is excitable and this is the result this is because of their polarity so the polarity is basically opposite right you have a positive and negative characteristic to something um, so this polarity is referring to the this negative and positive that's present at the cell membrane of these neurons and, and myocytes muscle cells so I say, you know, all cells exhibit electrical properties at the cell membrane, but nerves and muscle cells can change this. So the outside the membrane, right, is positive, inside is negative. And again, we call this at rest, with no change occurring. Just as you sit there and nothing's happening, this is the characteristic of the cell membranes. Right? And so it is polarized. Again, positive outside, negative inside. Okay? And I say this is extremely important, um, and this results from differences. So why did we get this polarity? Um, differences in concentration of ions. Remember, ions are charged, right, molecules or elements. All right, so concentration of ions and the permeability. So what is allowed to pass through the membrane? So let's you know, go back and revisit Chapter 3 here, right, that the cell membrane is a phospholipid bilayer. So two... Here's a layer, and here's a layer, bilayer, with a hydrophobic, so water-fearing core because of all these fatty acids. But here, with a phosphate head, there is a charge. So this points outwards, and this is this aligns this way automatically because generally the solutions, right, biological solutions, are going to have some degree of charge and polarity because they these are water-based solutions. All right. So these solutions we just refer to collectively as extracellular fluid and intracellular or cytosol, all right? And this, of course, is a characteristic of the membrane. It has all these different things. We saw, again, in Chapter 10, this idea of, right, the channels, the sodium channels and the acetylcholine receptors, right? So we have the presence of some of these same things here in the neurons cell membrane. So the key ions that we want to focus on are sodium, potassium, and calcium, all right? It is absolutely imperative that you remember now and for the rest of your life that sodium ions are very high outside, right, out here, outside of the cell, and potassium are very high inside. And therefore, potassium is low outside, and sodium is low inside, all right? So these ions, all right, move. Not a whole lot because, again, this hydrophobic core prevents that, all right? So, but we can change this permeability by opening a channel, all right? So ion channels are key to being, getting these to move and therefore cause electrical change, which is what we said. We have to achieve enough electrical change to get an action potential. All right, these channels, right, as I show you one here, are specific due to the charge of the ion, right? Again, here we're going to focus on sodium, potassium, and calcium, the size of the ion, and these are all fairly small, and only interacting if you are the right size and or charge. Some of these channels are opened by specific events, and we have called them gated, all right? So a ligand-gated or anotropic, right, and I won't use that term, right? open when a signaling molecule binds. So this is what happened, right? When acetylcholine bound to its receptor in the muscle cell membrane, right, the sarcolemma, there was a ligand-gated, right, channel for sodium right there. And so that event of neurotransmitter binding is what triggered the opening, see, specific events, All right? So here they're showing that again, acetylcholine coming along, making contact receptor site, right, channels close, but as soon as it attaches, it opens, right? Now, ions are going to move in response to their concentrations, 
All right, so here they show you sodium and calcium moving in, potassium moving out. Now that, again, depends on the, the channel because we haven't really, right, here we, we're using some generic, okay? They're just kind of color coding, right, potassium are these blue balls and sodium are purple and calcium is green, all right? And so, again, the important thing right now in this cartoon is to realize that now calcium, too, is high outside of the cell. And so if I open the door, because it's high out here and low in here, calcium and sodium are going to come in, as it shows you. And potassium, which is high here, will go out. And again, this shows you rest. This shows you change. All right. So physical distortion of the membrane can actually cause this as well. So these are mechanically gated channels. So again, so what does this matter? Well, because you're going to have to think about what is it that gets all these different sensors excited? How are they going to start their electrical changes? All right? And so mechanically gated means that some distort some movement, right? This is going to be like your stretch receptors and your proprioceptors as we go on. So if there is a change, again, that's physical, in, in the shape of the membrane itself because you're pulling or tugging, right? Then that opens the channel. We call it mechanically gated. And so these are typically the touch receptors, pressure, and temperature. And this again just shows this idea. Same outcome, right? Sodium goes in, calcium. In this case, um, they had high calcium in here, right? And it's going out. So again, the idea is sodium and calcium are generally high, right, in the uh, exterior in the ex and low in the inside. But again, we're focusing on this mechanically gated channel. All right? And we also have voltage gated. So they got this little kind of, <laughs> right, um, ball and chain here. It's a little, uh, just a cartoon, right, just to il illustrate this idea. So voltage gated channels, right, are going to open and close with a change in the electrical potential. So if the electrical properties of the membrane change, right, the inside is negative and it becomes less negative, right, so more positive, right? <laughs> then that opens. And again, this is showing you starting membrane is in minus 70. Now we have a minus 50, and that's enough of a change in voltage to open this channel and start to see this ion flow. All right. There's also leakage channels. So, I mean, just giving you the basic uh, overview of all these different channels. These have an intrinsic rate. So within themselves, they switch between open and closed, right? So there's, it's, it's not, we're not giving their opening and closing to anything specific. It's just they will open and close at, at intervals. And this is really, these leakage channels are really how we establish a resting membrane potential. All right. And so again, here showing closed, opens, and we have the higher concentration move out. Okay. All right. So membrane potential. Uh, as we measure this, here's again a, a voltmeter and here's a probe that is stuck into the membrane. And this we can record. So this, you know, this is how we initially have done this and discovered this idea. And if we do this in a non-stimulated cell membrane, we see the following. We see again, we said positive outside the membrane, negative inside. So our resting membrane potential is minus 70 millivolts. All right. I say the electrical state of the membrane varies, and this potential is really a distribution of the charge across the membrane, and it is stored electrical energy. So again, stored energy, it's not doing anything, but it can. It can begin to do something with the right stimulus. All right, so we compare the inside to outside with outside at zero, and technically this difference is only at the membrane surface, all right? And it's this difference that allows muscle and nerve to generate electrical signals that we call action potentials. All right, so the resting membrane potential. Okay, so here we're actually measuring it, seeing its change over time. All right, that last slide we were again, just measuring it. Now we're looking at it changing over time, excuse me. All right, so here's our rest millivolts, minus 70 millivolts. When the cell is not being stimulated, ion channels are closed, and we're not going to worry about which gates and what, we're just ion channels are closed, except for leakage ones, okay, so leakage ones, and that means that sodium concentration is more outside, and potassium concentration is more inside, 
The inner membrane there has negative proteins, the cytosol has sulfates, and